Hi, everyone. Hello, folks. We're in the book of Genesis, still in the first two verses, because these two verses are the liberation of Western man and what we hope the whole, whole human race sooner or later from the superstitions of paganism. Let's read again verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 1 and then discuss the difference these verses have made to the way we look at the world and God. I'm reading from the NIV. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. How do these verses undermine the foundation of pagan polytheism, specifically here, the first part of verse 2? Let's look at what the Babylonians and the Egyptians had to say about the creation of the world, because some have seen the connection between the Babylonian and Egyptian and other myths and the Bible. They've seen the imagery is parallel but they don't look close enough at the message mm. the so picture what the picture means they see similarities and think oh they're the same or one came from the other yeah. well let's look at the probability of that as we look at what the Babylonians had to say about this chaos in the beginning this is again from the book the Babylonian Genesis by Alexander Heidel under the heading primeval chaos Heidel says this, the Enuma Elish and Genesis chapter 1, that Enuma Elish, by the way, is the name of the Babylonian or original, supposedly, of the Genesis account, according to some mythographers. The Enuma Elish and Genesis chapter 1 both refer to a watery chaos, a feature which is found also in the cosmologies of the Egyptians and the Phoenicians, and in the Vedic literature, the Vedic literature being the ancient sacred literature of India. Enuma Elish conceives of this chaos as living matter and as being an integral part of the first two principles, Apsu and Tiamat. Notice Heidel calls them principles, not gods. Apsu and Tiamat, in whom all the elements of the future universe were commingled, while according to Genesis, it is nothing but a mass of inanimate matter, which was afterward separated into the waters above and below into dry land and ocean. So people see the imagery is the same and, and mm -hmm. assume that somehow the concept of the one God could be derived from this primeval chaos. Whereas the Bible assumes nothing of the kind. It's The first verse is before the second verse in the Bible. In the beginning God created. Notice mm -hmm. there's no God here. There are two principles, Apsu and Tiamat. And those words, by the way, seem to be related to our English words, our English word abyss. Mm -hmm. So there was an abyss of chaos in the beginning. And then this word tiama, which is capitalized here, as is apsu, as if it is a, a god, but as I think the word that Heidel uses is better, principle, tiama, is related to the Hebrew word tehom, right in this text. Mm -hmm without form and void. So the Hebrew original is connected even etymologically, that is linguistically, with these concepts in the Babylonian myth. Now look at the Egyptian myth and see if it adds anything to the ancient concepts of, of, of what is the origin of all things, according to E.A. Wallace Budge in his book, The Egyptian Religion. Yes. Uh, so he says, according to the writings of the Egyptians, there was a time when neither heaven nor earth existed, and when nothing had being except the boundless primeval water, which was, however, shrouded with thick darkness. In this condition, the primeval water remained for a considerable time, notwithstanding that it contained within it the germs of the things which afterward came into existence in the world, and the world itself. At length, the spirit of the primeval water felt the desire for creative activity. And having uttered the word, the, word, the world sprang straight away into being in the form which had already been depicted in the mind of the spirit before he spoke the word, which resulted in its creation. 
The next act of the creation was the formation of a germ, or egg, from which sprang Ra, the sun god, within whose shining form was embodied the almighty power of the divine spirit. End of quote. So you can tell, even on the surface reading, that the Egyptian account is more like what we call today the theory of evolution, i.e. Mm -hmm. within some primeval matter, there was the potential for both life and intelligence. A kind of spontaneous creation of, of, uh, of into being of things. So that made me think of, of uh, the little I know of Darwinism about uh, the fact that he saw maggots on, on meat, that the first assumption was, was that, that it just sprang up kind of on its own. Well, before the invention of the microscope, we had no choice to, but to believe that life could spontaneously generate from existing matter, even mm -hmm. if it was dead matter, like let's say, let's say waste materials from which mm -hmm. uh, flies, of course, derive their nutrition. But we only know the truth about that because of modern science. Mm -hmm. Ancient man looked at the world and saw that it seemed, at least to the naked eye, and to the naked intelligence, that yeah. life they, could spring from nothing. Mm -hmm. But we know that life only comes from life now. And modern study of DNA just in the last two generations has borne that out, as mm -hmm. indeed has the Big Bang Theory, proven once and for all that although even until a hundred years ago we were still pondering whether or not we needed, whether creation out of nothing was the truth or whether matter coexisted with intelligence, that is God, for mm -hmm. indefinite periods of time before the mm -hmm. creation of the world and as we know it. But the Big Bang Theory seems to have put an end to any idea that matter is coexistence, is coexistent with intelligence. Mm -hmm. The thing that struck me was this sentence that the spirit of the primeval water felt the desire for creative mm. activity. Well, that, that doesn't seem to make sense if it's just you know, not a creator. That's that's trying to stick a creator in there. Um, it it didn't make s sense to me. But I can see how people can look at it and see some similarities because this spirit uh, that's that's that has this desire. It says spoke the word, imagined mm. it, and it came true. So I can see how people think, oh, it's so similar. Yeah. But there is some similarities, but there's also a big difference. In that it's within that you're get, you're yeah. getting things created, not something outside creating it. So this idea of a transcendent God who is also imminent within the creation is mm -hmm. is beyond the pagan mind, mm. and 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 I think we can't underestimate the importance of that. That this was a total break with paganism. So even in the first verse, as Pearson sums up in this short quote at the end. You have the dismissal, not just of ancient paganism, but of modern theories that are alternate explanations for the creation of the world. So what does Pearson, what does Pearson say is eliminated even by the first two verses of Genesis? The opening sentence is a grand specimen of the beauty and truth here compacted into the briefest compass. It excludes atheism, pantheism, polytheism, materialism, denies the eternity of matter, and teaches the eternity, self-existence, independence, omnipotence, and wisdom of the Creator. So all of these truths that we just assume, if we believe in a one God, even if it's mm -hmm. not the Christian God, all of those truths are not self-evident. As Paul plainly points out in the other text we want to read here, which mm -hmm. is 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, is it verse 21? Yes. Uh, it says, For the wisdom of the... No. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. So, of course, Paul is thinking primarily of the pagan world as he would have known it, and the Corinthians would have known it, so uh, the world of Greece and the world of Rome. Mm. But he seems to be summing up the 
the negative achievement of all paganism here in saying that the world through its wisdom didn't get to know God. Mm. There are things, according to Romans 1, that we can know through the creation, mm -hmm. but the, the nature of the true God and his, his glory, his holiness, which is of course meaning primarily his separation from all else, including the created universe. Mm -hmm. So his transcendence, the, the world did not know at all. They couldn't yeah. figure it out. It had to be revealed. Yeah, so the limitations of man. So I think sometimes when when I've read this verse in 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 the past, we think of of it being kind of anti-intellectual, but it's not. It's just saying that we have limitations in what we deduce from things that we observe. We yeah. still could be wrong. Yeah, indeed. Now, some of these theories, as we just said, were still with us within the last hundred years until mm -hmm. modern physics really exploded the idea that the world could create itself, that it had the potentiality within itself. Mm -hmm. Now, people who try to reconcile the Bible account with evolution, though, and you must make some attempt, in, in if you're a Christian thinker, that to, to put all of this, that is modern theories of science, into the context of the Bible data and revelation. There's, there's a, a theory that tries to account for the biological ages and for the geological ages mm -hmm. that evolution assumes are tens of millions of years in duration at least. Mm. And that's called the gap theory. So I want to read a, a quote from John Davis again about the gap theory. This is a book we've already showed you and read from last time, Paradise to Prison, Studies in Genesis by John J. Davis. And here's what he has to say about this gap theory that tries to explain where is there room in the Bible account for dinosaurs. geological ages and dinosaurs, etc. Mm -hmm. Here's what, here's Davis's summary of the gap theory. The gap theory, more accurately described as the ruin reconstruction theory, sees an indefinite time gap between verses 1 and 2 in Genesis 1. This theory, in one form or another, has been advocated for centuries, but its modern form originated with Thomas Chalmers of Edinburgh University. He proposed it in 1814 to accommodate George Cuvier's theory that the Earth's fossiliferous strata are the product of a series of catastrophes. Notice this is about 45 years before Darwin comes along. Mm. Chalmers made room for these catastrophes between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. The gap theory was given wide circulation early in the 20th century by George H. Pember, whose Earth's earliest ages appeared in 1907. By the way, that's a mistake. The book had come out about 30 years before that, and it's been reprinted in many editions since. And it was made, given wide circulation also by the Schofield Reference Bible, which appeared in 1909. C.I. Schofield advocated the gap theory in a note on Genesis 1, but in a later edition of his Reference Bible, the note was relegated to Isaiah 45. Pember argued that the traditional interpretation of Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, had been deeply influenced by the pagan concept of creation out of chaos. In the third edition of his book, however, Pember revealed his real motive in advocating the gap theory. The solution of ge geological difficulties, he said, connected with the Bible, critical care in translating the original is all that it, that is the gap theory, needs for its support. And while it absolutely disables the attacks of geology upon the book of Genesis, it casts no discredit upon science itself, for when rightly understood, the Bible is found to have left an interval of undefined magnitude between, between creation and the post-tertiary period, and men may bridge it as they can with their discoveries without fear of impugning the revelations of God. So in other words, we can stick all of it between those two verses mm. and not worry too much about the Bible's credibility. And then Davis goes on, the most scholarly and lengthy defense of the gap theory to date is Arthur Custance's Without Form and Void, published in 1970. And by the way, Ar Arthur Custance's work you can download from the website that was created by his uh, 
secretary and you can get it all for free it's wonderful stuff but not to be taken as infallible in its interpretations of mm -hmm. of genesis or but very suggestive and i think very thought-provoking stuff mm -hmm. the gap theory davis says is as generally taught today <coughs> asserts that in the dateless past god created a perfect heaven and earth the earth was inhabited by a pre-adamic race and ruled by satan who dwelt in the garden of eden satan desired to become like god and eventually rebelled this of course i'll derive from the passage about lucifer in the king james of isaiah 14. thus sin entered the universe and god's judgment came in the form of first a great flood and then when the light and heat from the sun ended a global ice age all plant animal and human fossils date from this great flood and are genetically unrelated to plants, animals, and humans on the earth today. Yeah. We, we need to say right away, though, that this is not the majority theory. Yeah, I'm, I'm not satisfied or persuaded by it. Uh, it's, it just seems to, to me to be an effort to come up with a solution to a problem and kind of without really getting it from the text getting it from something that's not there and assuming it should be there or that it could be there. So I'm not persuaded. Okay. What does Clifford Wilson have to say about the theory? And Clifford Wilson is a, a popular apologist for the Christian faith. He, he wrote a book called In the Beginning God. Okay. It says, teach, his, he says, teachings of the Bible do not need to depend on isolated words. Important truths are developed in various parts of Scripture, but no clear case is established for the gap theory. By appealing to a possible translation of one word in a way that seems to be out of proportion to the consequent teaching. So, I guess I agree with Wilson. Yeah, context. And there's yeah. no indication in Genesis 1, verses 1 to itself that we're talking about a subsequent creation rather than the original creation right I, I think it part of it is just th this desire to have an answer I mean I can see that there's a, a, a problem there or a, something that 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 we don't understand but then I think we're limited and, and so I guess I'm, I'm satisfied that we're limited mm. and we might not have the answer to, to all the questions that are out there so the attempt to try to reconcile geology and biology, and specifically evolution with the Bible, mm. I think it's beyond any of us because we just don't have enough information about the ancient ancient past. Mm. But, but science has been reconciled with the Bible in other areas. For instance, we wanted to link a video by William Ramsey, the great non-believing archaeologist who upon ex exploring with the, the Bible in hand, specifically the Book of Acts, Mm -hmm. came to see that there is a way to reconcile the historical data of the New Testament with the science of archaeology, as he exemplified it in his day, and by the way, was knighted for it later. So we put that link on your screen, mm -hmm. and also a discussion we did on how, by the way, in another book by John Davis, Moses and the Gods of Egypt, Davis makes the point, even in the title of the book, that the judgment of God upon Pharaoh and Egypt was a judgment upon the gods of Egypt. So we'll put mm -hmm. that, that video up too on your screen. Okay. Next time, what's the subject? Uh, oh, this Next time it's Sovereign God, outside creation, yet within it. Mm 